we have the word of God in our hands and we want to hear what God has to say. So let's ask him to open our eyes and enable us to hear. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness to us that you have written a book and you have preserved it. You have collated it. You've preserved it. And we have it in our hands, in our language. We thank you for the wonderful blessing that is. And we ask now that as we open your word that it would not be in vain, but we would listen to what you have to say, that you would, by your spirit, apply it to each of our lives as is needed. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have a stated purpose, actually three stated purposes for studying the book of Revelation. Uh, the first one I mentioned was to receive the promised blessing that we have in uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, there's a blessing there. Blessed are those who read and those who hear and those who heed the words of the book, of the prophecy of the book. And uh, so that's one of our objectives, one of our desires. The second one is to see the Lord Jesus Christ, to see him in uh, maybe a new light, in a, in a new way, um, to have a fresh vision of who Jesus is and to learn of him. Our third stated purpose uh, in studying the Revelation is um, to learn to hold truth graciously and humbly, to uh, not possess truth in, in such a way like it's a, like it's a hammer or a weapon in our hands, with which we assault other people. Um, I, I just, I, I warn us against that uh, kind of uh, mindset. And um, as we study Revelation, there are a lot of opinions about the book. Uh, and some of them differ. And they differ, and the reason this is particularly significant is because they differ inside the Christian community. Inside Orthodox Christianity, there's a variety of interpretations related to the Revelation. And there, this variety is held by people who know the Lord and who love the Lord and who walk faithfully with him. They're not people who are off the, the beaten path of the truth. There's a narrow way that leads to uh, heaven, and they're on that narrow way. But they have a different opinion than I do, for example, about the Revelation. Well, we need to learn to hold the truth that we have humbly uh, and graciously. Now, in our first, in chapters 2 and chapter 3, we have been seeing the letters that the Lord Jesus Christ dictated for the churches, seven particular churches located in Asia Minor. And uh, we are now at the letter to the church at Sardis. Now, when he wrote his letter to Ephesus, he identified them by the things that he said to them as an orthodox but unloving church. They had lost their first love. He addressed Smyrna as a persecuted church. He had nothing negative to say about them. They were under severe persecution. He addressed Pergamum as a church that was uh, tolerant and doctrinally compromising. He addressed Thyatira, which we saw last week, as a church that was tolerant to sin and had a false teacher among them who taught them to pursue idols and to pursue immorality. And, and the church stomached that, so to speak. They didn't deal with her. They didn't properly um, discipline her and if necessary, put her out of the church. Today we come to the church of Sardis. And Jesus identified the church at Sardis as the dead church. Dead. Let's read the letter. See what I mean. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name that you are alive, 
but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it, and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who are, have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, may God bless to us the reading of his word. So as we open this letter, we see that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, presents himself as the one who has the seven uh, spirits of God and the seven stars. As we said when we first saw the vision that the Lord gave John of himself, he identified himself uh, using these characteristics as the one who has the seven spirits of God and the one and having the seven stars in his right hand. Regarding the seven spirits of God, um, it's my opinion, I believe, that this phrase, seven spirits of God, is probably a reference to the fullness of God, a God's spirit in his ministry. That's, that's debated. That's one of the things that is in the discussion of those who are godly people they have different opinions about what is specifically being referred to. Um, scripture, more than once, uh, presents the Holy Spirit in a plural manner. This idea of multiple uh, is connected with the Spirit of God. For example, it says in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 2 and 3 of the Messiah, that the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. And then there's a multiple description of the Spirit of God. Spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel and strength, spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And the Messiah will delight in the fear of the Lord. That's an example of a presentation that has this concept of multiple with the Holy Spirit. Also in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 to 14, Zechariah saw a vision in which the Lord... Uh, spoke of the seven eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout the earth. And in this vision, the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel through Zechariah was, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And by that, putting of the spirit of God with this description, the seven eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout the earth. We, there's another example of a multiple description of the Lord Jesus, of, of the Holy Spirit. Well, well if, if I'm correct in my conclusion, I believe that this indicates that Jesus, spirit, Jesus uh, possesses God's Spirit in his fullness. Seven is a number of completion, and if he possesses the seven spirits of God, then it would be, an, and if that is indeed a reference to the Holy Spirit, then this would indicate that he possesses God's spirit in his fullness. And in a dead church, what are they missing? <laughs> well, they're missing true spiritual life. And who is the author of true spiritual life in human beings? Well, it's the spirit of God who imparts life to us. Jesus has what they need. They need life, and they need the one who gives life, and Jesus has that, if they'll only receive him. He also presents himself as the one who has the seven stars, in his, well, in his right hand. In chapter 1, verse 20, we read the interpretation that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. There's discussion, too, about what does this mean? What is it specifically referring to? And there's a variety of opinions. 
And let me tell you, this is not, a, this is not the gospel. This is not a core truth upon which you say, well, I'm going to separate from you because you don't believe like I believe. Because there are godly people who have different opinions about what the seven stars represent. I think that the seven stars is a reference to seven messengers, seven pastors, seven leading people in the church. It's the, it's the angel of the church that the Lord Jesus addresses, to which the Lord Jesus addresses his evaluation that we read here. And that's the way it is in all seven of the churches. And I take this to see, I see it this way, that here is Jesus, the controller, the overseer, the great shepherd of the church, addressing his church, which in this case has forfeited godly leadership who are following dead leaders and are hence dead. Next, we come to Sardis, the church. We have no record of the founding of this church. We do have the general statement in Acts 19.10 that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So the church had been founded at some point uh, after the Lord ascended from earth and um, in the 30s, and now we are, here we are, in 96 AD. So some 30 to 40 years later, we see in that the Lord Jesus writes to this letter a tragic letter. It's a tragic letter for a tragic church. It appeared to be an active, uh, busy church, productive, perhaps with Looked really good on the outside, but it was dead. There was no real, substantial Christian life. It was dead. There's no mention of this, of the persecution of this church. It was dead. You don't have to persecute a corpse. It's dead. They'd been fully assimilated into the world. The only historical artifact that we have of this church is from uh, Melito, who was a bishop or a pastor in this church in the second century. And he, uh, some of his sermons are still in the record. And he wrote an apology for Christianity to Marcus Aurelius. There's no current embodiment of this church today. That's Sardis the church. Dead. Let's take a moment and think about the city itself. Learn some things about it. Sardis was the ancient of the, was the capital of the ancient Lydian Empire. That's an empire that existed uh, in Asia Minor. Well, here's, here's a map of it. Um, let's say 750 BC to 500 BC. This city um, had an amazing geological formation which made it very difficult to overturn. It had a huge um, rocky outcrop of, of Mount uh, Petolus, uh, Tamolus, and it was unapproachable from three sides. It was 1,500 feet tall, sheer cliffs on three sides, and then there was a land there was an approach to one of the, in one of the sides. So, so get, you get the image of that big city in uh, Lord of the Rings, you know how they have that depicted. Well, that, that's what Sardis had that from a military viewpoint. It was a significant military fortress and it was thought to be impregnable, uh, but it wasn't. It wasn't impregnable. It was captured in... 546 BC by Cyrus of Persia who, who had a Persian soldier climb up 
the sheer cliffs and get in by the unguarded, unwatched way and enable the Persian army to come in. So in 546 uh, BC, uh, it fell. Also in 214 BC, Antiochus captured the city. Now, by the time we get to John's day, there was a population of about 120,000 uh, people in that city. It was a center for dyeing wool and garments and carpets. And so it had this big uh, fortress kind of um, crown of the city. And below, the city spread out broadly in the very fertile Hermas Valley. And uh, it was very rich agriculturally. It was also rich from a, from a mining viewpoint. Some notable, notable people that had been in Sardis in the history of Sardis was King Croesus. He's the one who lost the city to Cyrus in 546 BC. Also Aesop, uh, Aesop's fables. Uh, there's a mention of him in the literature of being Aesop of Sardis. The river that runs through the Hermas Valley, the Pactolus River, um, was, a, was a river from which gold was panned. And in Sardis was the first mention of historically archaeological fi finding of, of coining gold and silver. The city worshipped Sibylle, who is very similar. That's the, that's the uh, Asia Minor goddess. That is very similar to the goddess in Ephesus of Artemis. She was a mother kind of god. Her worship of her was very decadent and um, feasting and sexual immorality as, as a part of the worship of this goddess. The city itself, the name Sardis, became a byword for slack and effeminate living. That's the city in which this church dwelt. So now we come to the evil that the Lord Jesus addresses to the church. He said, I know your deeds, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. He says, I know your deeds. And we've seen this before, haven't we? This is the fifth time that the Lord Jesus says to a group in Asia Minor, I know, I know, I know your deeds. I know everything about you. Nothing is hidden from our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only was the church of, si of Sardis open and bare before the eyes of God, but you and I are open and bare before the eyes of God. And he said to them, you have a name. You have a name. They had a reputation. There was something noteworthy about this church that gave them a, a, a reputation. I don't know what it was. It doesn't describe what it was. Maybe it's that they had great programs or they had a great reputation in the community. I don't know. But he said, the Lord Jesus said, you have a name. You have a reputation. This brings up a, an interesting analogy. I found this in one of the books I was reading. So let me tell you about the star analogy. These, uh, the vast distances uh, between stars has forced astronomers to come up with um, an appropriate measurement unit called the light year. One light year equals the distance that light 
traveling at 186,000 miles per second travels in one year. Already my mind is blown. I mean, I can't really relate to these things. Light traveling at 186,000 miles per second, the distance it travels in one year, that's identified as one light year. That's more than six trillion miles. The enormous distance to the stars from our Earth presents a very interesting possibility. Consider the North Star, for example. The nearest star is 30 light years away from us. The North Star is 33 light years away from us. Now, if that star died, exploded and died, five years ago, then the light from that star would continue to shine on this earth and we would not know of its destruction for another 28 years. The star would look alive, but it's dead. And so it was with this church. They had a name that they were alive. The light was shining. They appeared to live, but they were dead. I know your deeds, that you have a name, but you are dead. When the Lord Jesus Christ, the one possessing the living spirit of God, the one controlling the leaders of the church, says you're dead, then you're dead. The church, by definition, embodies life. The living God dwells in its people and the spirit fills yielded believers with life and the Lord Jesus rules and directs the life-giving ministry that the church does. Believers have been made alive in Christ. But this church was dead. Are you familiar with the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. That is a poem that was written by Samuel Taylor Coleridge in 1798. And it speaks of a becalmed ship on a painted sea, like a painted uh, ship on a painted sea. The crew had died. It's, it's a sort of an interesting story. I won't tell it to you right now. You can go look it up like I did on Wikipedia and find the whole poem and read it if you want. It has seven chapters. But it talked about a ship on which the crew had died. But the ship was mysteriously propelled in some way. And the Poet says, dead men steered it, and dead men manned the oars, uh, manned the sails, and dead men worked the rails. The ship moved, but it was manned by corpses. It sailed, but it was dead. And in a similar manner to Coleridge's poem about this ship, this church looked alive, but it was dead. It was socially distinguished, but it was dead. All its works were just the grave clothes for an ecclesiastical corpse. Jesus continues, I have not found your deeds complete. If you will remember, Jeff mentioned it this morning in the sermon. He used this verse as well. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. That's a gift of God. Not as a result of works that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're created for the purpose of doing good things good as evaluated by God, which God prepared beforehand 
so that we could walk in them. Now, the Sardian church was filled with non-believers, spiritually dead people. So much so that that was the characteristic description that the Lord Jesus gave of the church. Yet it seems that in the church there were some true believers. They had become lethargic and complacent and they were sleeping There were some true believers, either among the congregation or among the leaders, but the Lord Jesus evaluates them and says, your deeds are not yet complete. Do you remember what Daniel explained to Belshazzar about the hand that wrote words on his wall? He said, when he was called up to interpret what was written on the wall, that it meant you have been weighed, you have been measured, and you have been found wanting. That's what Jesus was saying about this church. I have evaluated you, and you've been found wanting. What would Jesus have to say to this church? What would Jesus have to say to you and to me as people in his church? How would he evaluate us? This was a tragic evaluation. You have been weighed, you've been measured, you've been found wanting. And here's the note. Notice that most of the people in this church were not even saved. But there were some believers that he addresses. We'll see that in a moment. When the majority of a church has a certain characteristic, then the Lord Jesus evaluates the entire church that way. So, with that evaluation, what did the Lord Jesus require of these believers? And we see that in verses 2 and 3 that he required five actions of those true believers. Wake up, strengthen the things that remain, remember what you've received, keep it, and repent. Wake up, he said. Wake up, wake up. This is no time for indifference, for lethargy and for slumber. Rouse yourself. Become watchful and alert. Wake up. Secondly, he said, strengthen the things which remain, which are about to die. Invigorate and stabilize and shore up the spiritual truths and graces that do exist among you. He said, fan into flame the dying embers. There is more to do and you've not done it yet. Strengthen the things that remain. Thirdly, he said, remember what you have received and heard. Call to mind the truth. They had in their hands already available to them by this time all the letters of Paul. There was a lot of New Testament truth that was available to these churches. He says, call it to mind. Reaffirm the truth of Christ and sin and salvation and holy living. Go back to the basics. Learn the fundamentals again. Reaffirm those truths. Remember what you've received and what you've heard. Then he calls them to keep it. Remember it and keep it. What does it mean to keep something in God's economy? Well, it means to obey it. To safeguard it. Notice that obedience is required here. This, the, way out of, the way out of sleepiness with respect to your Christianity is obedience. And obedience requires action. 
and obedience is required. The failure to obey is something that needs to be repented of. And having an orthodox belief without having a living lifestyle response to that truth, that won't bring renewal. So he tells them, repent. Repent means I'm going one way and I turn around and go the other. Have an immediate change of mind and of direction. I just want you to note that indifference to spiritual decay, indifference to spiritual lethargy and deadness is sin. And it's something to be repented of. Repent. Now, these five actions that are required of the true believers that Jesus enjoined upon the true believers in Sardis was accompanied with a threat. He said, if you will not wake up, if you won't wake up, I will come like a thief and you won't know what hour I'm going to come. Tell me, why do thieves come? To sit and have tea? To watch the game? No. No, they come for the purpose of destruction, to bring harm. And in what way do they come? Do they send a, an announcement? Save the date? Save the date. I'm going to come on this day and I'm going to wreak havoc in your house. I'm going to violate your privacy. No, they don't send a note that they're coming. They come with stealth. They come without warning. Jesus said, I'm going to come like a thief. That's not just a nice saying. That means he's going to come suddenly, he's going to come without warning, and he's going to come for the purpose of some judgment. Something bad is going to happen when he comes. This is a threat. A threat. I will come over there. I'm going to come there. I'm going to deal with you. You don't know when it's going to happen. But I'm going to come deal with you. Now this is not a reference particularly to the second coming. It could include that. But this was a warning to the church. I'm going to come to you and I'm going to deal with you. To destroy the church at Sardis. If there was no revival. He said, I'm going to take your lampstand out. You're done. That's the required action. Now let's take a note of the good things that the Lord Jesus said. But you have a few people in Sardis, he said, who have not soiled their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. It encourages me to no end that the Lord never overlooks true believers. Even in Sardis, where they were really, well, where they were a dead church, he did not overlook these true believers. He does not forget true believers. And while the number of believers was small, it was insignificant. It was not enough believers to actually affect the way the church was characterized. There were still genuine believers in that church. That gives me hope for certain people in various churches. We know that the church teaches false doctrine but it's very possible that there are some true believers in that church. There's not enough of them to affect the actual overview of who the church is and, and how they live and what their official positions are, but there can be still true believers in those churches. It's possible. Here's an example of that happening. But there was not enough of them to affect the Lord's evaluation of their deadness, but he didn't forget them. 
He said, you have not soiled your garments. Garments is a symbol here. Garments is, he's not talking about they didn't get dirty clothes. It's a symbol. He's saying that the garments represent their character. Just as clothes uh, are what are on the outside of our body, so our character is what is on the outside of our soul, so to speak. It, it reveals um, what is on the inside. These few believers were unpolluted, even in this decadent environment, and they maintained a godly character. He said, they will walk with me in white. These unsoiled believers that were living in the midst of a dead church in a decadent city, they will walk with me in white, he said. White was worn for several reasons in the ancient world. It was worn uh, for celebrations, for festivity. It was worn for uh, as, uh, after a victory, in the victory parade, white was worn. And he says... Th- These people who are true believers in the midst of a difficult situation, those who have a measure of purity and holiness on earth, are going to be given perfect holiness and purity in heaven. And I love that. We strive to be holy. We strive to do what is good. And we strive to do what is right. But we know it's mixed with the things of our flesh. And our flesh is tied to the world. And it's vulnerable to the temptations of the world of the devil, it has its own source of temptation, and that flesh is, we're carrying our eternal, our new life in that flesh, and the flesh is connected with the world. That's why we struggle with sin. That's why in this life, we will never never stop struggling with sin. But there's also the opportunity to do what is good and to do what is right and to become habitually a person who does right things and good things. We can overcome that flesh. And those of us who do that will be given white garments to wear in heaven. Now Jesus continues with the same vein as he makes the promise to the overcomers. He said to the overcomers, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. I will not erase his name from the book of life. And third, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Tremendous promises. The one who overcomes. We know who the overcomer is, right? The overcomer is what? No, the overcomer is not Jesus Christ. He is an overcomer. Who are the overcomers as defined by scripture? Christians. True believers. How do we know that? What's the scripture? What is, the, what is the scripture? I'm going to say, I got two more weeks that I'm going to say this because he talks to the overcomer two more times. 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. And whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Daryl, Daryl, there you go. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you have saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? There's there's a, a lot of dimension to that question. But do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? If you do, and if it's a genuine saving faith, then you, by definition, are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. Let scripture interpret scripture. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. As I said, white garments could refer to festivity. That'll happen in heaven. True believers will attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
in chapter 19, verses 7 to 9. It refers to victory. All true believers are going to be victorious through Christ over sin and death and Satan. It applies to that. But it primarily applies to purity and holiness. We see in Revelation 19.7, just as a definition, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. I wrote this paragraph down just so we could see it very clearly. Not only do we as Christians and believers today possess the imputed righteousness of Christ. His righteousness is on our account. And when God looks at us, he looks at us through the lens of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's a forensic righteousness. It's ours and it's absolute. Not only do we have that, but by obedience to his word and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we do the good things that God has prepared for us to do If we do that, then in heaven, those good deeds, those practical acts of righteousness will adorn us. These white robes, it's a symbol. This is a symbol. The righteous acts of the saints will adorn them. They represent in some part our reward for faithful service. This is not a statement that everybody in heaven will always walk around with white robes on. Like the cartoons have. Like we have even in our own minds. This inaccurate view of heaven. Just a bunch of... It's an insipid view. It's, It's a weak, repulsive view, actually. Walk around floating on clouds just with your hands here and a little halo above and that's supposed to be heaven. Well, that's Satan's lie. That's not heaven. Heaven's a totally different place. We don't have time to go into that this morning. These robes are a symbol. A symbol. They represent the reward that we get as a result of our righteous deeds. Okay. That's one promise he makes. The overcomer will be clothed in white garments. The overcomer, he says, to the overcomer, he says, I will not erase his name or her name from the book of life. There's a, there's a, this is a figure, there's a figure of speech in this, in this statement. It's called a litotes. I just learned it yesterday as I was reading and digging. This is where someone, where one affirms something Affirm something by negating the opposite. It's like saying, well, he's not a bad runner. What does that mean? He's a good runner. She's not a bad-looking woman. Well, what does that mean? That means she's a good-looking woman. Okay, you, okay? You're not a bad dad. That means you're a good dad. You negate something, you you affirm something by negating the opposite. Well, that's what's happening here. I will in, by no means, I will in no way, Jesus said, erase his name from the book of life. I will not do this negative thing that affirms the positive thing. It means that we are secure. This is not a threat. Well, if you don't do right, I'm going to erase your name from the book of life. That's not what it's saying here. This is a promise. This is a promise about the security of the believer. I will never, never erase the name from the book of life of the one whose name is recorded there. I will certainly keep his name in the book of life. I will certainly keep her name in the book of life. I I just, I, I love this. Beloved, we are secure in Christ. True believers cannot lose what God has given them. Their faith will not fail. They will endure. 
they will endure. And God will not erase his name, my name, your name, from the book of life. I've watched some people die and they did it so graciously. Just so graciously. And I think, I'm not sure if I would have grace like that when I die. I don't think I have dying grace. Well, I don't because I'm not dying. When the time comes, then God will dispense that grace that's necessary. And in a similar manner, we say, I I don't know if I could resist when persecution comes. When I have to make a stand for Christ, and if I make a stand for Christ, then something bad is going to happen, either to my family or to me. To me, to me is bad enough. To my family would be worse, right? And I I don't know if I could stand up under pressure like that. I don't know. But I also don't need to worry about it because he will not erase my name from the book of life. My faith will endure because it's faith that's given to me by God and I don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. Promises are made regarding those times. We have one promise. Don't worry about what you're going to say when men persecute you because I'll give you the right words to say at that moment. I read Stephen's sermon that he said in Acts when he was getting ready to be stoned. uh, And I look at that thing, I said, good grief, this is amazing. It's a fantastic sermon that he was giving. Well, I can't do a sermon like that. Well, wait wait till you're faced with death. Maybe I will give you the words you need to say. Okay. I will confess his name. I will confess his name before my father and I will confess his name before the angels. There are no unknown... There are no residents in heaven whose name on the door says occupant. (laughs) There are no unknown occupants in heaven. Every one of us will be known and we will be recognized. We will have a place of significance and we will be included. We will be personally recognized. It says the Lord Jesus is saying, I am with him. I am with her. And he will recognize each individual person before the Father and before the angels You will not be obscure in heaven. You will be known. And you will be identified with. There will be no one who will be an unheralded, unknown occupant in heaven. All overcomers will be known, acknowledged, and claimed by Jesus Christ as his own. Woohoo! Woohoo! What a wonder, what a wonder. He gives an exhortation. We've seen this four times. We'll see it twice more after this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this takes what Jesus dictated for the church in Sardis and applies it to all the churches throughout the ages and around the world and it applies it to you and me, every believer who has an ear. She who has an ear, let her hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear. Listen up what the Spirit says to the churches. This is for you. Okay, so what are we supposed to hear? I just summarized four points. Uh, Jesus is looking for real life, not external activity. Complacency and lethargy are sins to be repented of. The good deeds that God has prepared for us to do, if we do them, will produce an eternal weight of glory.
Fourth, I am secure in Christ. I am holy and righteous. And this will be fully experienced in heaven. What a wonder. How awesome is this? Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful to you for the truth that you have uh, recorded for us here. We thank you for these promises to the overcomer. I ask that you would give us grace to evaluate the the state of our, our life, that you'd enable us to put our finger on the pulse of our spiritual life and, and feel if there's anything beating there, that we would not be caught in the trap of having a name that we're alive but that we're dead. We pray that, Lord, for our church. We pray that you would do work in our church and there would be spiritual life exhibited among us that would be real. We ask these things, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.